You're listening to the Podcast Detroit Network. Visit www.podcastdetroit.com for more information. I said, hey, hey, welcome to the Man Cave Happy Hour. I said, hey, hey, welcome to the Man Cave Happy Hour. We're going to drink a fine whiskey and smoke a really fine cigar. I said, hey, ladies. All right, it is happy hour. It is time for the Man Cave Happy Hour Whiskey Cigars, Spirits, and Stories that go along with it. I'm Jamie Flanagan. Hey, I'm Matt Fox. Hey, guys. Hey. hey. <laughs> and we are here with Joe Lewis Bourbon. Tasting Tuesdays with Joe Lewis Bourbon. We, uh, it's, a, it's a highlight of my week, Matt. What about you? <laughs> it's just, the, the, the week has just started when uh, we get here on Tuesday. So, yes. Oh, my God. What a, what a week. <laughs> this this, this <laughs> Monday is just a warm up. Monday is just uh, a stretching, getting ready for tasting Tuesday. And uh, I have a couple drops. Look at that empty bottle. I have a couple drops of chili. Look at you. Bourbon <laughs> left. And... The, the, the really good talk. news is it's available in 100 re- re- retail locations around the area. So. Yes, Michigan. Yes. Uh, it's lighting up with uh, lighting up the <laughs> lighting up the arena with uh, yeah. Joe Lewis bourbon. And uh, yeah, so it's available all over the place. Uh, I just got to get my 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 backside in my car and, and get somewhere. But today we're going to talk <laughs> about uh, becoming really knowledgeable, Matt. Uh, you and I, the whole premise behind the man cave is that Matt and I are idiots. Uh, <laughs> very, you knew that. So self-proclaimed. Yes, yeah, self-proclaimed at that. Yes. <laughs> we're, very, uh, we're very immature when it comes to knowledge of bourbon. We enjoy it. We like it. We want to learn about it. Uh, and, and apparently you can become a, a bourbon steward. Uh, and Peter, have you gone, I, I believe Peter went through this process. I did. I did. And before, I, before we introduce Michael, and, and I'm really excited about having uh, Michael on the show with us tonight, I just want to say that tonight, right now, mm-hmm. this very instance, we were all supposed to be together at the Detroit Shipping Company yeah. for the grand launch yep. of Joe Lewis Bourbon. And, and we were all so excited for that, and we worked so hard for that, um, and wow, uh, what a gut punch, and um, what a gut punch. It's, uh, mm-hmm. it'll, this is something I, I think that I'll remember for the rest of my life, and uh, is really, I was look, so looking forward to sitting with you guys uh, tonight in Detroit. It was going to be a mad, mad affair. You know, well, there's a bright that side going to happen, right? Is it okay? What's the bright side, Michael? The bright side is that we've had two weeks head start on getting to taste it, <laughs> right? We would have had yeah. to wait until you would have had to wait until tonight. That's it. Your yeah. bottle's already empty. We've been all jealous uh, of everybody, uh, but yeah. So that's uh, that's the thing. We're going to find out about uh, becoming a bourbon steward. We got uh, Michael Meyer with us, and, and Michael is is a bourbon steward, and it's uh, it's Stave and Thief. Uh, is that am I saying that correctly? You are. Yep. Okay. So, Society. M- Michael, uh, tell me about your childhood. <laughs> I love that <laughs> question. <laughs> I think you said my childhood. Is that what we yeah, were? Yeah. 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 What's the what's the back? Funny enough, I f- funny enough, I grew up in De- you know in the Detroit area. I grew up on eleven mile in Lasser. I went to South Philly Lathrop. So uh you know, t- being uh, being part of something that's uh, you know Detroit born and raised is is fun. It's exciting for me. And um, but uh, you know, travels kind of took me all around, uh, bartending, managing bars, kind of all around the world, from the Caribbean to Israel to South Dakota to Alaska. And I found myself uh, back in or here in Maine, and um, I was working for one of the big distributors. And uh, at that time, I was a whiskey ambassador for the Northeast, and I wanted to. My goal at that time was to become one of these world brand ambassadors. I thought, you know, what could be better than traveling the world, drinking whiskey, billing it back to the company? And um, I had an interview with the, the lead guy in Diageo, right? His name is Ewan Morgan. And uh, I wanted to become part of the, the world master whiskey master class. And we had some interviews. We talked. And he's like, oh, you really like it. You got to move out to Pennsylvania. And I said, well, you know, I got a wife and kids. Everyone likes it here in Maine. I don't think it's going to happen. And he goes, well, you know, that's as far as we can take this thing. But I still wanted something to signify what I knew about whiskey. And in 2014, there wasn't much. And I started, you know, looking online and uh, 
early on, Stephen Thief really didn't have much of a name. Uh, but I rolled the dice. I flew out to Kentucky. I took the class. And as I was sitting in the class, I'm kind of gazing around at everybody. And, you know, in the front of the class, who do I see? I see you and Morgan, who's the director of Diageo, who I just had this interview with. So I go over to him and I was like, hey, man, you know, what's the director of Diageo whiskey doing at this class? And he says, everyone that's going to be a whiskey ambassador for Diageo is going to take this course. And from that point forward, I knew that it had legs to it. I knew that it was a real course. Um, once I was certified and what I tell the people that I reach each this class to is this becomes, you know, part of your professional persona. Not only it's not a certificate you just get on your wall and you post it up there. It's a lapel pin that you wear and you sign off on your LinkedIn accounts, you know, your email address, you know, certified bourbon steward. It becomes part of who you are. The same way WESD uh, wine certification is for a, uh, for a wine sommelier. So uh, really, it's, it's a way to signify the education you have with bourbon, which is, uh, which is nice. Amazing. I, we, we, you went way too fast, Michael. <laughs> <laughs> So I'm gonna, we're going to rewind. We're going to go back a little bit. Israel, you bartended in Israel. So part of your adventure, did you say? I, 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 I worked there. I worked there oh. in the food industry, but I didn't bartend when I was there. I bartended in, uh, I bartended in Alaska. I bartended in, uh, in um, South Dakota, and I bartended in the Caribbean. All right. Where, so where in Alaska were yeah. you uh, bartending at? Was it uh, I was there bartending. in, in Elmendorf? Uh, was it, uh, it Elmendorf Air Force Base is out there? Uh, that's around the Anchorage area, or were you up closer yeah, to Juneau? I was actually in Whittier on a cruise boat. Oh, Ooh. <laughs> even better. Ooh. <laughs> All right, so the cruise line. So is, is that was that part of the deal, the Caribbean and, and Alaska, were, were those cruise lines you were working with? Uh, you, it was really seasonal jobs, and uh, they were contractual seasonal jobs. So every time the season ended, uh, depending on who you knew and, and what was going on, you kind of would get invited to go somewhere else. So the guy that I was rooming with in, in South Dakota – uh, we, we parted ways when I went to Alaska and then he called me, he was running the Helton, uh, in the Caribbean and said he needed a bar manager. And once I got there, I ended up, uh, with a different gig, but, uh, you know, just, uh, just the way it is, you know, when you're, when you're traveling around and, and bartending and industry yeah. stuff. So All right, take me to Israel. Well, your itinerary goes like this. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> What's that now? Take me, Mr. take your me itinerary to, goes like this. We're, we're traveling <laughs> around in the, in the business. <laughs> take me, take me to Israel. What did you do in Israel, and how did you, how did you get there? Where did you work? Uh, Israel, I, I went to uh, work on a kibbutz, and I ended up in their, uh, in their kitchen, just uh, you know, doing maintenance, doing serving, you know, just kind of uh, cutting my teeth. It was a long time ago; it was almost twenty years ago. Okay, but uh, you know, it really kind of made me fall in with in love with the industry, uh, with traveling, and uh, you know, just. Uh, it was really, it was really just the start. So, uh, a kibbutz was a different lifestyle. It was, uh, you know, you weren't paid very much at all. It was just living conditions. Uh, but it was the exposure. It was the, uh, experience. Wow. All right. So now you said you were, you, you were, you offered a gig in, in, uh, with, with Diageo, but you, you wanted to stay in Maine, right? So tell, me about, tell me about the girl that made you settle down. <laughs> Uh, well, when I was, uh, I was managing a nightclub in St. Thomas and, uh, at that time there was only two nightclubs that stayed up until four in the morning. <laughs> and, uh, we had, uh, from two o'clock in the morning to four in the morning, we had all the other industry people, all the other industry bartenders come to our bar and, you know, it picked up from two to four o'clock. So, uh, my wife who, uh, who I met there, she was bartending at one of the bars next door and it just, uh, you know, just kind of how it happens. And, uh, I, there was a point where I said I was never going to leave. Uh, you, you know, <laughs> you would catch me dead off that island. And uh, the moment she goes, so when are we moving? You know, I was, well, whenever you want to. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I know. So, <laughs> and, and it, 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 then, then it became where are we going? And we went to Colorado for a brief, I think it was 11 months, maybe 13 months. Uh, it was like, I like to ski. You want to ski? So we skied. And then we just couldn't get away from the ocean. And uh, yeah. I said, where, you know, I'd rather see the ocean every day than never go in it. Where do you want to go? She said New England. So as soon as I got an opportunity in New England, we, uh, we went to and moved here to Maine. Nice. All right. So and we, had, and we had Joe Lewis Bourbon. We're very lucky that he did so. Yeah. Because, because when, when we first got going, we knew we needed somebody who could teach us a little bit about bourbon. And we met Michael. And Michael got me involved with Steve and Thief. And he's 
talking about the lapel, and that's it right there on my jacket. And uh, fantastic uh, class, a tremendous opportunity, and I thought it'd be wonderful uh, to bring Michael on on the show today and uh, talk about a few of the things and ask some questions of him that maybe some people are, you know, find a little mysterious uh, about bourbon, and maybe he could uncover some of the secrets that are on the label and, and talk to us about the tasting world. So yeah, that's, uh, that's where we're headed next, right? Let's dive into Joe Lewis. Um, so Peter, when you guys were connecting with the Davis Valley Distillery, and then how did you, how did you, were you already a bourbon steward at that point when you were uh, trying to, trying to pick the, the formula that became Joe Lewis? I was, um, you know, Michael, I took Michael's class. Michael, Michael runs a company called Man and Oak. He is the man uh, when it comes to the oak in, in Maine. And uh, people, people all over Southern Maine attend his various seminars on a regular basis. And he teaches a great class. I encourage anybody who has an opportunity to uh, check, out his, check out his website, check out, his, uh, check out what he does. And uh, you'd, be, you'd, uh, you'd benefit greatly by learning, learning a little bit about bourbon from Michael. Uh, and, and so I knew that, uh, you know, bourbon was something I drank, uh, but it wasn't something I knew a lot about. And I, I wanted to learn more and, and grow my appreciation for the spirit and understand, you know, more deeply uh, the history uh, and the distilling process uh, and, and, the, and the label. The label, people, people are, are fooled by the labels. And I mean, a great example, I think, is age statements. Age statements are tricky things. Yeah. And uh, how do you read an age statement? What's the difference between a straight bourbon and bourbon? Um, you know, where, you know what's, what are all those secrets? And you, you pick that up in Michael's class. And so it was a great opportunity, great experience for me. And I, I'm always happy to say I'm a Stave and Thief bourbon steward. It makes me happy. Let's not forget that when we were deciding, we were tasting. Mm -hmm. Michael led the session for us up in Portland, right? So, and and I, I have a question for, for you, Michael. Since you tasted it before it was in the bottle, does it taste different when it's in the bottle? <laughs> well, you know, there's, there's a satisfaction to knowing, but, but yeah, you know, it's, it's, it's all about your olfactory and your senses and, and uh, you know, how your brain associates the, the taste. So, you know, before we were just kind of, tasting through a lot of proofs, right? We had the mash bill down and, and Peter uh, and JJ knew they were going with the Davidson Valley Distillers, which I think was great. And the mash bill was, was fantastic. And it was really, at that point, what proof do, you know, do we want to go with? And uh, we were doing a lot of evaluating rather than, uh, you know, just sitting back and appreciating. So yeah, it tastes different. Yeah. Tastes better, doesn't it? It does. It does. It does. When, you're not, when you're not trying to make those decisions, yeah, it, it tastes better. Now, remember, we, sure. we were comparing it. I forgot. We compared it to – I forgot what we compared it to. Do you remember? Oh, uh, we had um, – oh, that's a good question. <laughs> it, was, oh, golly, it was a long time ago, and we're all getting old. It, it was. <laughs> it I really think. was. Uh, we compared it to a New England corn whiskey – uh, just just for giggles, and I can't remember the name of that one. Um, and then we did uh, Clyde Mays, I right. believe, and yeah. the um, we had one more in there. Uh, it really just kind of give us a, a, a sense of the different mash bills and where we wanted to be on proof. And um, I think we had a, a, a barrel finished one, if I believe. We um, well, we we had uh, we did we we had a. Uh, no, we had well, we had a sample that was barrel proof, but we didn't use that for the tasting. That was that was just the sample that was set, 120 yeah. proof. Cool. And we had right. it, we had it proofed down to 85, 90, and 95, and that's what we're deciding. Mm -hmm. Michael, tell tell us a little bit about Man and Oak in your business. So again, when I um when I was a whiskey ambassador, I really wanted that extra, you know, uh, certification, something saying that I knew what I knew, and uh, because uh, I, once I was State of Thief certified, uh, I really wanted to give that experience to other people. And my goal uh, when I opened Man and Oak was to be kind of this unfiltered uh, whiskey, kind of rogue whiskey ambassador. You know, you start talking to whiskey ambassadors and, and they're very brand oriented, which is great, but they can be biased one way or another, right? They're drinking the Kool-Aid of their own brand. Mm -hmm. And 
I've been asked to do a lot of tastings for bachelor parties, for weddings, uh, for companies. And I wanted to do it in an unbiased way. I want to give them the best bourbons or, or whiskeys to taste. And I didn't want to do it, you know, because the company wanted me to do it. I just wanted to choose from everything and talk about it openly. And, uh, and that's what Man and Oak is. We do seminars, we do whiskey blending workshops, we do bourbon certification courses. I've brought in people under uh, my label to do tastings as well. Uh, for one for no, it was Robert Robinson. Uh, he's well known through the scotch industry. Uh, but um, really, it's, it's just an unfiltered whiskey bourbon education program. And, uh, and I'm happy to have created it. It's going really well. So, Michael, if you could um, w- walk me through when you're doing a tasting, what are some of the um, skills that you utilize with a group of people there? Are, are you clapping hands and rubbing them together? You know, you know, tell me a little bit about that. It depends on who, who I'm doing it for. Um, I mean, if it's a really advanced group and we're tasting through, let's say they want to taste through uh, a, a single brand but different barrels, we're going to do all the advanced mm-hmm. things like clapping our hands together, rubbing it, getting the aroma of the grain. Most of the time, it's for a novice group that really just wants to pair bourbon with food and have a good time. Sure. So, you know, the things that I'm thinking about are, you know, keeping it, what are they going to remember, right? I don't want to dig too deep down to the minutia of, of every little detail. Right. Uh, I'm also not, I don't, I, I've always despised the wine experts that would come into a room and they go, you know, they smell their glass and go, oh yeah, I get stewed apples and, and grape upon and, you know, they just shake their head and, they look at you, you look at them, and because you're shaking your head, they start shaking their head like, oh, yeah, some apples. I get that, too. And uh, it was really the power <laughs> suggestion that I didn't like that uh, brand ambassadors and, and whiskey people do that. So I really try to just break it down to what is a whiskey? Why does it taste the way it does, right? Why do you get caramel with bourbon? Why do you get vanilla with bourbon? Mm-hmm. And the degree to which you taste that at a tasting is really to your olfactory and your senses. But I want people to understand why those – things are there and not just regurgitate a uh, tasting note. Yeah. No, we, we've said it plenty of times, you know, everybody's got their own palate. You're going to taste something completely different from what, mm-hmm. uh, from what Jamie would get or from what Michael would get or from what Peter would get. We all have that different, but we all end up tasting a really good bourbon at, at the end of the day. Right. <laughs> correct. Correct. And one of the things that I like telling people, you know, it's not that we're all tasting, you know, so much of a different thing, but it's how we digest it. Right. Mm-hmm. When, you know, when I, when I get caramel, you know, my olfactory, your olfactory is what ties a sense to a memory, right? So my olfactory, if I get caramel, may take me back to my grandma's house where she had those caramel candy chews. And maybe my grandma was a really, really great person. So anytime I smell, you know, caramel in anything, that's what triggers those memories. And that's what triggers my senses to appreciate it. That's other nice. people, other people may smell caramel and may take them to their aunt's house. They had a vicious dog and, you know, they couldn't stand the smell of the place and they're like, yeah, caramel just doesn't do it for me. And they just don't, they can't articulate why, but it's up here and how you perceive it. And we perceive the same thing in different ways. Perfect. So can I ask a question? Does that mean that you, you, your grandma is the reason why you like bourbon? <laughs> no, <laughs> definitely, definitely not. But uh, it's, you know, the best example I could give for, uh, you know, something we all kind of smell within bourbon and, uh, and, and a good grandma-esque uh you know, uh, analogy. No, well, that depends. I, I think that that's, I think that's so true though with bourbon. I notice, um, since I've really made a study of, of my pastime and a business of my pastime, uh, I, I've got maybe 15 different bottles open and, you know, mm-hmm. all sorts of, all sorts of mash bills, all sorts of age statements, all sorts of localities and water. And you know what? They're all a bit different. And sometimes there's one I really like a lot on a given night. And another night I hit it, it's maybe not, you know, maybe it doesn't, it doesn't come across the same way to me. But I think it's one of the beautiful things about bourbon is, is that the drink itself you know, brings up a lot of uniqueness every time you have it. It's not like drinking Coca-Cola. Every time you drink a Coca-Cola, it's the same old thing. Bourbon has that mix. It mixes up on your palate. So, Michael, with uh, Man and Oak. Depending on what you had to eat later earlier that day, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, Michael, with man, man and Oak, Michael, um, going through your, can you become a stave and thief suburban steward through Man and Oak, or is that a separate thing? No. Uh, after I took the class at Stave and Thief, I wanted to recreate that class here in Maine. I saw that they were doing courses outside of Kentucky. So, really, you know, in 2014, the only way to do this was to fly down to Kentucky, 
they take the class at Moonshine University, a really cool name, but it's a really cool place. And they do distillers courses, they do bourbon certification courses, they do uh, rum distilling courses. And uh, I saw that they were doing these courses in St. Louis, as far as the certified bourbon steward, and uh, I think Chicago, a lot of the bigger markets. And I called and I asked, I said, hey, are you guys coming to Maine? And you get the answer, not in a mean way, but you know, that you would expect to get, you know, if you're like, hey, are you guys coming to Maine? They're a small company, they're like, no. (laughs) <laughs> and um, and I was like, what well, do you guys care if I, you know, take this on? And they're like, you know, yeah, uh, have at it. And they, I don't think they realized what I was going to do, which was pretty much recreate the class. Mm. And it stirred up so much energy within the Portland bartending community. Uh, yeah, I mean, we had a sold out event. It was 40 plus people. Everybody, uh, every brand was there being represented. Every main distiller uh, I invited there to represent their brands because Stephen Thief is really – an extension of the Kentucky Distillers Association and the Kentucky Bourbon Trail. Um, but with it and being that I was teaching the class, I wanted to include main distillers in this course as well. And they, Save and Thief was great. They gave me full blessing to do whatever I wanted to do as long as I was sticking true to the course. Um, mm. It's an online course. So I teach the class. It's an eight hour class. We go over everything from the history of bourbon to the labels, to uh, distilling science, to types of bourbon. Uh, and it's a very hands-on class. We do a sensory uh, uh, um, analysis. And uh, at the end, you take the course online, and it takes about a day or two for them to grade it. It's not something that I'm sitting there marking down if they get right or wrong. It actually goes to Safe and Safe Society. They grade it. They grade your essay. They send you the certification. And uh, if you go to Kentucky, there are a lot of bars that if you're wearing your lapel, they'll mm-hmm. actually give you 10% off either the entire bill or 10% off the bourbon. Uh, there are a lot of distillers that give you breaks on, on the, uh, uh, the tours if you have a Stephen Thief Society pin. So it's, it's picking up. It's really cool. Um, it's, uh, it's, and, and through me, uh, I do them every once in a while, maybe at least once, once a year. I don't, I don't want to flood the market in Maine and have everyone walking around with a pin. But, uh, but uh I was going to do another one right before, uh, you know, this all set us home. But uh, as soon as we pick up, we'll do another one here. Well, you know, like- one of the one of the things I learned in the, uh, in the in the class that I think is really valuable is putting together flights. And, you know, when I'm online and I'm reading, I'm reading in all the groups and I see people making comparisons of bourbons. One of the things I see a lot and, and a, a real common and easy way to understand, I often see people comparing uh, a wheat forward bourbon to a rye forward bourbon, and and I, I ask myself why would you bother? You know, it, it's the the two flavors are so far apart, and the two bourbons are so uniquely different. You know, what possibly can be gained by by matching them up against it? And and so I, a lot of times I'll chime in uh, when somebody's comparing bourbons and the mash bills are so far apart that is you know it's. Uh, it's meaningless, it's meaningless. I think to compare the two of them, it's a contrast for sure. And and I got that. that that's something I really picked up uh, in the class. And the other thing I really liked about the class was learning how to use this thing. Oh. And 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 I thought I thought you'd talk a little bit about the tasting wheel, Michael. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, the, the, dread, the dreaded the dreaded uh, tasting wheel. Taste. It's um <laughs> the dreaded tasting. So you see those you see those all the time. You see them with wine. You see them with, in any spirit uh, category. You have to see them with gin and and uh, tequila and, and rum. Uh, but really, that 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 sheet, if you can hold that up, Peter, it really helps you drill down um, a, a tasting note. So what you really do with those is you start from from the inside, and if you're given a few, uh, you know, broad categories. When you're tasting something, hey, does it smell like, like wood or does it smell like spice or does it smell like sweet? Then you could be like, oh, yeah, you know, maybe I get all those things, but maybe it's really sweet. So then you go to the next category down and you're like, well, what kind of sweet? Is it fruit bread? Is it candy? And then you're like, oh, you know, it's fruit bread. And then you go another and you can just keep refining how you get down there. So when you're seeing and you're reading uh, whiskey magazines like Whiskey Advocate or uh, Bourbon Enthusiast, and you see these guys and they're putting down these tasting notes and you're like, how do they get there? They're really using these tasting wheels and they, they kind of drill down and drill down and drill down and drill down and get more precise on what they're tasting, what they're experiencing uh, with the uh, flavor wheel. 
So looking at the, uh, at the bottle, right? You said uh, there's a lot of things that a bottle and a, and a label um, are going to tell you. So what can a, what can a label tell somebody? And, and what is Joe Lewis's label telling us? Uh, label, labels are everything. I mean, they're really the key to, you know, especially if you're, if you're a bourbon nerd and, you know, you kind of hunt through stores, you're looking for something you've never had before. Uh, labels are going to tell you the age. Labels are going to tell you, uh, you know, where it's coming from. Labels are going to tell you who the distiller is. Uh, labels are going to tell you the mash bill. They're going to tell you the backstory. And, uh, you know, one of the things that's great about the Joe Lewis bourbon and, and that I was really happy that Peter kind of took to heart is uh, he tells the backstory about Davidson Valley Distillers. And, and I was really happy that he decided to do that. Some, some brands aren't able to. They sign non-disclosures, and, and that's, uh, you know, sometimes sad. They do for protection. But uh, as a bourbon fan, I want to know where the bourbon's coming from. And I want to know that that person creating the bourbon, that person supplying the bourbon, are both equally proud of each other. And uh, when you see that, I mean, you can just start diving right into it because you know about it. And that's the fun part about bourbon. So one of the things that Joe Lewis is telling us is that's straight bourbon. So we know this is two years old or more, right? It can be, it can be, uh, it, you know, no matter what, it's two years old or older uh, with straight bourbons. And that's really great because a lot of these craft bourbons, you know, they're spending uh, six months in the barrel and that's it. And, uh, you know, they'll put it in small writing somewhere on the back, you know, eight for six months. Um, it, you know, with a $60, $70 price tag. Mm -hmm. So straight bourbon is always something you're looking for because you know it's been aged uh, accordingly and properly, which is, which is uh, great to see. Um, Michael, can I add something uh, to that age statement? When, what people should be looking for, there's a whole growing category of whiskeys and bourbons that are not aged in barrels uh, for, like, they should, like they used to be or they're supposed to be. They still qualify as a, as a bourbon mash bill but not a true bourbon and if you look at there's a number of them and i have some over here but i don't want to call anybody out um that it says aged at least one day because uh, yeah. Yeah. because it's been it's been in contact with oak usually in an expedited way either yeah. in a tank with oak or or in a, in a in a machine i call it like a like a um a dialysis machine where it pumps it over the wood for 18 hours and it gets the equivalent right. of two years of aging but you people should look at that because you, you'll see a lot of popular brands are, are, are kind of uh, going that route so yeah there's there's no way to, there's, bourbon, there's, there's, yeah there's no way to fake you know having a straight bourbon on your label you can't it's impossible uh ttp laws won't allow it so it's one of those things you know you what you're getting is authentic you know what you're getting took the time to actually become a bourbon it's not a frankenstein bourbon uh, I know several of the ones you're talking about, um, but uh, yeah, it's, 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 it's a good sign, you know, and you want to see that when you're looking for a bourbon. All right. So bourbon, this is, uh, we're at 90 proof, right? 45% alcohol. Is that the minimum for, to be able to be called bourbon or is it 80? Is it 80? It's 80. Okay. It's 80. Right. So we're, we're a little hotter than the, the bare minimum, right? Yep. Yep which is nice, brings it up a little bit. So that's the thing about uh, a, lot of, a lot of people who start drinking a lot of bourbon. The more they drink, the hotter they want it, is what, what I find from, from people that are really <clears throat> into it. And they just, they just want it to like, just blast their heads off. And, and, and I enjoy that once in a while, but uh, generally speaking, I don't like to blow my head off with my bourbon. That's not going to be a what? daily drinker <laughs> if you're blowing your head off. Yeah. Well, one of, the, one of the things you got to, I think a lot of the people that know uh, their bourbon well and they really get into it you're getting a bourbon let's say like a, a booker's and it's 132.5 percent if you actually know the equations and know how to downproof accordingly and you know what your what your preferred proof is like if i know if i want a bourbon uh, that bourbon is always at at uh, 90 proof and that's where i enjoy it that's my sweet spot and i can get a bourbon that's usually uh you know at 132 point something but if i know how to get it down to my preferred proof it's, 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 it's awesome. Right. So it's really about uh, a, how does it taste out of the cast? You get to experience that. And then you get to downproof it yourself precisely to where you want it. Um, what's nice about 90 proof is that you can add a little bit of water. You can add an ice cube and you're not diluting it to the point where it's not bourbon anymore. Uh, you know, but it's not so hot. Like you say, it's going to blow your head off, which, which I never enjoyed either. I never understood why people, you know, try to challenge themselves into this, uh, 
you know, this, this, uh, this contest of what you can take as far as the proof goes. But um, what do you think of this? It's empty, but. <laughs> <laughs> well, we know what but, you thought of it. <laughs> yeah, it's good. Now, so this is, I'm not usually a fan of anything that's over 100 proof, but the, but the Weller Antique 107. Of course, you know, it's a weeded, it's weeded bird. Yeah. You know, for me, for me personally, um, I, I love trying all sorts of spirits, and sure. I, I think the more the more you've tasted, um, you know, the, the, you know, you you can find the positive, uh, even in even maybe in a spirit that you wouldn't drink on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. And for me, what we wanted to do with Joe Lewis Bourbon is we wanted to make certain that it was easily approachable. You know, we wanted to be sure uh, that it could be a daily drink or something. Somebody crack open, you know, at eight o'clock at night and have a drink before they crash out a little bit later. And 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 that isn't, you know, to me, um, that needs to be a bourbon that's easily approachable, not too awfully hot, and and not way out on the various palates that that some bourbons or some other some other spirits bring to you. Not that those, not that those other, you know, more, you know, maybe exotic type spirits. Um, are are bad, but they're definitely not going to be something to drink every day. All right, before we get into the bottle itself and, and start tasting it and talking about the aromas and the, the oh, the we're flavor. waiting to taste it. Oh, yeah. Well, no, <laughs> it's talking about tasting it because uh, I've been tasting it too. Matt and I, we did a little promo for the show yesterday, and we talked about it. And I, I mentioned to Matt, and I don't know if you guys have seen it. Uh, but they did an appraisal on the Antique Roadshow of a, a, a vintage bottle of Joe Louis bourbon. Um, have you guys seen that? I have not. Okay, it's kind of neat. I have so, seen it. I have yeah, seen it. So, Antique Roadshow. And it's, so it's an empty bottle, uh, sadly enough. But it's actually autographed by Joe Louis. It's autographed in pencil. Um, <clears throat> and uh, so the woman had it in her family. Her dad uh, was a big boxing fan. Uh, and he, he met Joe Lewis uh, in his travels, and Joe autographed the bottle. Um, and so they appraised it. Uh, it was missing. The, uh, it, it, the original bottles came with a, a pair of like little boxing gloves, little red oh, the uh, boxing. plastic boxing gloves. <laughs> and they said that really doesn't make that big of a difference. That could add like $50 to $100 to the value if they had the boxing gloves. Mm. But the, uh, the autographed bottle, you guys, uh, Michael, you know, because you saw it. Matt yeah. alluded to it yesterday. So, Peter, Michael, uh, which, what do you think uh, a Joe Lewis, a vintage Joe Lewis autographed by Joe, uh, would go for? I don't know, but I'd pay a lot more for one that still had the juice in it. Ah. <laughs> there you go. It was appraised at, with the autograph between twelve and fifteen hundred. Unbelievable. So, <laughs> oh, that's what Matt. That was Matt's call yesterday. Score. <laughs> 12, right. 12 and fifteen hundred. Yeah. Then, um, yeah. So it was. It was the pint though. It was a pint bottle that he had. Uh, that looks like the fifth. The picture there. Yeah. But, uh, the so yes. Yeah, so, <clears throat> that's the. Um, fifth. So, and uh, he said, but a, a Joe Lewis bottle without the signature um, it would still be five to $600. So, yeah. So, I was wow. pretty, I was pretty you know, uh, Just, uh, you, you mentioned the gloves, and, and I just want you all to know that eventually there will be a Joe Lewis edition that comes out that does, in fact, have the boxing gloves hanging okay. around the neck. And, yeah, and throwback. So, All right. <laughs> well, I can tell you what. Someday, when you've got about eight hours, I'll tell you the story of the box. Eight. It's. I can think of I, how many weeks of conversation went. Oh my God! I, I must have gone through three hundred cycles on that. Wow. <laughs> the boxing gloves almost almost derailed the whole thing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we, I thought that was I thought that was extraordinarily mm. interesting that uh, the bottles. There, now there's my question. Actually, all my all my question was: Have you seen uh, a bottle, a Joe Lewis, the original one? Have you tasted the original? Um, no. Okay. No. To the best of my to the to the best of my knowledge, none exists. Okay. Okay. Uh, and I have certainly, um, you know, maybe and candidly, maybe through you know, maybe through the Man Cave Happy Hour. Um, an appeal to anybody. Uh, if you can find a bottle of Joe Lewis bourbon anywhere, uh, please give us a shout out. Uh, we have no intention of opening it. It's a historical artifact at this point. And, um, you, know, you know, for us, uh, the Joe Lewis bourbon mission is about more than the bourbon. Uh, and certainly uh, having, having that actual bottle with the gloves around it as a testament to the, to the authenticity of the brand and a reminder uh, of where this all started would be uh, a tremendous thing for the company. Uh, we'd love to see it. We'd love to have it. Uh, and so I, you know, appeal to anybody who knows 
anything about that particular bottle. If it's out there, please call us. Yeah. That, that'd be something to, uh, hey, Peter, that'd be something to go after uh, Justin's House of Bourbon in Louisville. They're the uh, world's leader in uh, antique bottles of bourbon and see if oh. they have one. Yeah, I mean, it's I. on I, my I'll, calendar for tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> Just the South of Bourbon. They they got some pretty pretty rare ones for sure. You know, we do know, Jews, we do know the lineage though. The lineage is that the, the bourbon was brewed at, at the old Joe distillery that's now part of the Two Roses family. And four Roses, yeah. So, so so we do a four roses family. So we, we do we do have we do understand the lineage and, and there is you know, there is a lot of tales of, of Joe's experiences down there. I think we talked about that maybe in another show. Um, Michael, you know what I wanted to ask you? Um, you know, we touched a little bit about on, on aging and, and the labels on aging. Uh, and I, I think that's really key. But when, lately I've been reading about yeast uh, and the role that yeast actually plays in the distilling. And to me, that kind of reminds me of the role that, you know, the char plays in the, distil in, in the bourbon aging. Could you talk a little bit about yeast and 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 why that's important and how and how some of the legacy yeasts that are coming out are, might be important to get more involved with. Yeah, I, you know, you, it, it, it's important. It's important. Every distiller has, uh, you know, proprietary strand of yeast, uh, you know, that uh, Maker's Mark will go so far to ensure that they have it. They keep it at four separate locations in four separate countries in case there's a fire at their major distillery. They still have the original strand of yeast to, to keep uh, recreating that yeast because yeast is what kind of sets the whole mash in motion. Um, so without your yeast and without your proprietary strength of yeast, uh, your bourbon is different. Your bourbon is changed. Uh, so th they go through great, you know, pains to create a yeast that they want and that they want to work with. Uh, you know, back in the old days, they would use wild yeast, uh, just, you know, have those out there, you know, the, the open fermenters and, and let it kind of do its natural thing. Uh, but unless you recapture and do the sour mash and, and make sure uh, that process is, is using the same yeast, your, your whiskey is different. And the name of the game today is, you know, uh, being, being consistent. And uh, without your strain of yeast and, and it being proprietary towards your bourbon or your whiskey, mm -hmm. uh, you lose that uh, consistency. So that's why it's really important uh, from one distillery to another. Thank you. All right, so given, given Joe Lewis uh, a, a tilt out of the bottle here and into the glass, uh, it's very, to me, because, uh, again, 60, the mash bill, right, 66% corn. Uh, Michael, what's the rest of the rundown there? 14% rye and 20% barley. All right. So um, the barley, is, the barley is, is something that that's, could be considered a high barley. It's, it's a little bit unique, um, and it, but it works. On the, so for me, on the nose, it's very, very corn forward. Um, it's, it's, it's very uh, corn smell, and, and I like it. I, I like the corn. It's a different, um, if it, it different from other bourbons uh, you smell. I get less of the, less of the caramel and, and a whole lot of the corn, but then, then the flavor. So, so Michael uh, when I, Meyer, when I'm, when I'm tasting it, what should I be looking for in, in, in tasting, and how should I, I taste a, a bourbon? Uh, as far you know, as far as how you taste a bourbon, uh, you know, my suggestion to everybody is always, you know, try it neat first, and then uh, then add some water. And when you add water, just be consistent about how much you're adding. If you're just kind of throwing a splash here, and the next time you throw a couple splashes in, again, you're changing it every time, and it's a you're changing the bar that you're measuring from every time. So be consistent, whether that's a spoon, you know, a teaspoon or a water dropper. Uh, be consistent in how you're adding your water into your whiskey. Uh, if you're evaluating whiskey, don't use ice. Ice, uh, while it's pleasant, it kind of takes everything and it makes the whiskey catatonic, right? It pulls all the flavors real tight. And uh, that's why if you drink it real quick when it's cold on ice, it's because you don't taste anything. It numbs everything down. Uh, so that's, that's how you taste whiskey, or my suggestion for how you taste whiskey. Uh, with this particular one, you know, as Michael pointed out, the, the, uh, the, the barley's significantly high higher than you're going to see in a lot of bourbons, which is fantastic, actually, because a lot of them will use the, the, the barley part of the mash bill just to create the, uh, to get the enzymes a, a kick, a kick in the butt. And uh, they don't really use it for the taste. When what you get out of barley is a really soft touch, and, you, and it accentuates the sweetness. 
So this is a, an incredibly soft uh, bourbon. Uh, almost drinks like a weeder, even though it's not. Uh, because, uh, you know, you got the high corn. The high corn has got to have it to be a bourbon. And you got the high malted barley. So you don't have that flavor grain, uh, you know, dominating the bourbon, which is the rye. So you get a really nice, soft, sweet bourbon. And that's what I would look for in this one. Is it's just it's very, very approachable uh, and sweet and and, and soft. Now I mentioned that this got uh, last week. The uh, American Distilling Institute was supposed to have their annual conference, and they always have spirit. You know, they ju have judging, major judging, uh, and we submitted this, but it was before the Joe Lewis label was approved. So we submitted it uh, under a, in a, the same bourbon under a, in a different label, uh, and it won silver. Uh, it won a silver right. at, in the in the um, uh, genuine craft spirits category bourbon. So uh, you know, judged blindly, I guess you could call it, because no one even knew what what brand it really was. Yeah, you, you know, the mash bill is really so unique on this one. And, when you guys were coming up with it and, and you know, lit it out there that it was the mash blood of the was, I did some research and I was looking around. There's nothing similar in, in to a bourbon enthusiast. That's music to my ears. You know, a lot of people, when they create a bourbon, uh, they say, oh, I want it to taste like X, you know, and, and they, they, they just go one or 2% off the rye count on another one. And it, it just becomes all too, you know, the, the waters become muddy. And uh, this, it's a very, very unique uh, uh, mash bill. I think it speaks volumes to, to it's, uh, you know, how authentic it, it is. Well, so. Jeff has joined us. Hey, Jeff. Oh, hello. Well, hey, Jeff. <laughs> Are you there, Jeff? Wait, he's, he's connecting. connecting he's connecting. Yeah. yeah, there he is. He is connecting. Right on, right on. But he's got him muted. So, Michael, I'm uh, muting him. When I'm tasting this, Michael, I'm, I get like a lot of pepper afterwards nice. at the end. Where does that pepper, where's that pepper, or that spicy pepper flavor come from? It all comes from the rye. The rye is, a, the rye is your spicy grain. Uh, you're always going to get it exactly where you're getting it. You're going to get it, you know, in the end. And uh, That's what you do. It's, uh, it's what gives bourbon, you know, a nice balance. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. I was now, muting. now I know why he's muting himself. Okay. <laughs> Twelve there for a, a second. Yeah. So we should tell everyone who who Jeff is. Yeah. Hey, absolutely. Hey guys. Sorry about that. Who's Jeff? <laughs> All right. So th thanks for joining us, Jeff. Uh, Jeff. Jeff is our brand manager uh, with Southern Glaciers Wine and Spirits in Michigan. Welcome. And, and he is the guy. Uh, who is responsible and leading the sales effort for us in Michigan. And we couldn't be any more proud uh, to have him on board. And uh, Jeff, you, you missed a little bit of the show earlier today. Michael Mayer, he's a, a, a Detroit native living in Portland, Maine. And he's a, uh, he heads up a company called Man and Oak, which uh, does a whole lot of different things, including uh, the Stave and Thief bourbon stewardship, of which I, uh, I met Michael through when I got mine. And so we've been talking about, about bourbon, and it's suddenly occurring to me that I was supposed to send you a bottle of bourbon. I have not done that. I apologize. <laughs> that is okay. That is okay. Uh, oh, yeah, no, so, Jeff, uh, welcome to the Man Cave Happy Hour. Really appreciate you got, you got popping in and, and joining us as we do this in this new world, learning yeah. about bourbon, helping uh, the Joe Louis Bourbon um, company just get helping them to launch in detroit and all the work that you're doing here you know we, we need to meet face to face which was going to happen in about 12 minutes from now uh, yeah. when we're going to be here all together but um it is what it is but you know uh, share with us a little bit about uh your endeavors here in uh, the detroit market uh with joe lewis bourbon so to, to say the least it's been it's been interesting because <laughs> um, we launched the we launched the brand hang on one second my light is terrible <laughs> Sorry about that, guys. So, uh, no, turn it off. Turn it off. Uh, no, I'm just oh. kidding. <laughs> <laughs> we launched the brand. Um, I think we launched the brand the first week of of the the lockdown. Let's call it the quarantine in Michigan. Yeah. So it's been, it's been interesting to say the least. Um, yeah. We so in the first the first week, couple weeks we uh, we've gotten I think on Saturday I think we had 126 new new distributions new accounts sold in the off premise. Uh, which is good, which is really really good for um, 
for the, the, the situation that we're in right now. So I can't be happier with, uh, with how it's looking right now. Mm -hmm. If I had to look at it today, I'd guess that we're probably around, uh, probably close to 200 new accounts sold, which is a really good start considering all the things that we have going on right now. Right. Um, um, I think that we have the ability to grow exponentially. And I think that the, the, uh, the opportunities are there with, with, with all the activation that, that Joe Lewis bourbon has going on with golden gloves and things like that in Michigan. We had, we had a couple of events coming up. Um, geez, I think they would have probably happened this week if I'm not yeah. mistaken. This weekend. Uh -huh. yeah. So we had a couple of events coming up that would have really, really put up, put Joe Lewis bourbon on the map in Michigan. And, you know, I still think it's going to happen. I just think it's going to take a little longer, unfortunately. But, what a uh, gut punch, right? I, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm very confident and I'm very happy with how we've done. Our sales team has done basically calling accounts on their phones. Um, but, you know, our, our, our sales reps have great relationships in Michigan and they reach out to their accounts. And uh, it looks like, Peter, you had a really good call today with Woods Fine Wine. Um, and that's going to be really big moving forward. And then, um, you know, obviously the online atmosphere in Michigan is probably going to change because of this with the ability to order in Michigan. I, I would guess that there's going to be a change in the direction there um, with the ability to order online coming probably within the next six months to a year. You know, Jeff, say, let's hit, let's hit that a little bit more. I mean, um, you know, what else is going to change? I mean, when, when are we, you know, are we ever really going back uh, to, to the bar? Are we, are we ever going to find ourselves, you know, bumping shoulders in a concert? I mean, how long is it going to take for business to return to normal? You know, that's, 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 uh, that's a great question. Um, so in Michigan, our governor, Governor Whitmer, um, extended the restaurant essentially the restaurant closure it's not really a closure but in, in a sense it really is the restrictions on restaurants to april 30th uh i think that we're probably looking at mid-summer maybe end of summer before we see any any sense of normalcy um and even then i think you might see a 50 percent 50 75 percent capacity on you know what you and i are willing to go out and do what you're going to see in restaurants, what you're going to see in the on-premise in general. That's really, really tough to see. And I feel really, really bad for, for the on-premise um, accounts because a lot of these people are small businesses and they're doing the best that they can. And this is completely out of their control. Um, that being said, I do think you'll see it come back to normal to an extent. I just think it's going to take a long time because there is going to be to, to some sense, a new normal. Um, but you know, one of the things that you see in Michigan, and I think you've probably seen it across, across the United States, is a couple of things. One, um, with the on-premise closing, the off-premise had skyrocketed at the end of March. So we saw an off-premise boost across most brands, you know, 20 to 30 percent outside of what we would normally see because of the off-premise, because of the on-premise closing down or, you know, limiting what they can do. Right. You saw the first week of April, you saw a little bit of that still coming into play. Um, this week, it's dropped like a rock, and the off-premise has dropped exponentially. Uh, I would say probably tomorrow and closing out the week, you're probably going to see a big boost in the off-premise again because everybody's going to get their stimulus checks tomorrow. <laughs> um, so I think you're going to see you're going to see some change, but overall, from the perspective of on-premise, you might see a new normal. And I think, I think another new normal in the state of Michigan that you might see is Michigan as a, as a, from a government standpoint, is going to have to change and they're going to have to, um, they're going to have to become more, um, more efficient in the way they go to business. We'll put it that way. And Southern as a company is right there, ready to do it when, when Michigan's ready to take that on. Wow, it's uh, that's um, you know it's really really something to think about all the significant changes uh, that we're gonna we're gonna be going through, uh, and it's really hard to know where it all leads. Well, right. yeah. when, when when launching a a brand or a company in this type of environment, you know yeah. you know it speaks volumes that 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 Joe Louis Bourbon has been able to continue. 
um, you know, your, your plan, your business plans when, it, when starting a business has to be so spot on. It has to be able to live and breathe and change so drastically that it can maintain. So well, that's one of the great things that I really enjoy about Joe Lewis Bourbon, that you guys are really staying to that business plan as close as possible. You know, um, we always said uh, that this brand was more than, than the bourbon, was mm -hmm. more than the product that it was, you know, that we, we had accepted a certain responsibility and, and through accepting that certain responsibility created, you know, a set of requirements on yeah. us. And, and, you know, we've been fortunate uh, to, to meet really great people like the Man Cave Happy Hour. Uh, oh, like you. Southern Glaciers Wine and Spirits, like Michael at Man and Oak, and Michael, of course, Michael Short, Victory Spirits, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and and without, you know, without the um, flexibility, uh, without the commitment and the energy that all the people who have seen this mission and bought into it, you know, have, have been willing to put out, I don't know where we find the energy, really. <laughs> um, really? You know, it's, it's frightening, uh, but, you know, what we're doing is, you know, we've said if you've got to go, if you've got to go at it in this environment and get into the ring right now, who better to get into the ring with than Joe Lewis? And yeah, look, you guys, are, you guys, I think that for me, um, for you, Peter, um, I think that our, our communication across the board for us has been really, really good, and I think that that shows to the sales team. And I think it's going to continue to show with, with our activation when we can activate, <laughs> when we can activate. Um, I think you're going to see, you're going to see what, what we can do. And I think, you, I think your consumer is going to see that as well with, with, the, with the execution that our team does. It's going to be everywhere. You're going to see posters and things everywhere because we can. But, man, it's just been a, it's been a tough go. Well, we thank we, we we definitely want to be to let you all know that you know that J and JJ and I, uh, JJ McCarzo is my partner in this, and um, I, we just are, um, you know, we're really grateful and we're really grateful to have such a group of people around us, and uh, and we're, we're thankful uh, that that this is all going in this direction right now, and but you know I, this show was not to. You know, we're in here to you know commiserate about COVID nineteen and everything yeah. it's done to our lives. Um, you know, I, I think, <clears throat> excuse me, that having Michael and Michael Mayer up with us today and, and talking about bourbon in general is is really a lot more exciting. Yes. So, <laughs> Michael, I'm gonna go. I'm gonna actually gonna go out on a limb. I'm gonna say, Professor Michael, uh, <laughs> I think you got two new students. I think Matthew and I are going to be uh, signing up. Uh, well, so hey, he, listen, I I plan to come out. I mean, I've always wanted to. Come come you know home to detroit and, okay. and do one of these uh bourbon certified certification courses so uh you know once the madness is uh, died down a bit i think uh you know we'll definitely make that plan to go out there and uh and, and make this happen um uh somewhere around the, you know detroit so yeah uh, jeff i'll be reaching out to you uh you know seeing, seeing what brands we can get involved i've done this in maine i think you jumped in a little uh late but uh Basically, I took the Statement Thief uh, Bourbon Certification course, and, and with their blessing, I brought it to Maine, and it's been a really good success. Uh, they've been focused kind of in the Kentucky market doing it, and, and uh, being that uh, I, I was you know, born and raised in Southfield, uh, I would love to come home and, and do one of these courses. So, Michael, that would be fantastic. Do yeah. you do them online? Do you do them online, though? You can, so you can do it two ways. You can do this online. You can go to statementthief.com, and you can take the course. It's $60. You can download the material. Uh, you can spend a while reading it. I think it will make uh, what, what I do and what they do when you, when you get it in person and when you're seeing it, when you're getting a distiller actually talking about distilling, when you're talking to a bartender about the rules of bourbon, yeah. when you're, you know, having that hands on, especially if you're really into bourbon, you really want to digest this stuff. There's nothing better than hearing it, you know, one on one and seeing it and actually, you know, doing a nosing assessment and seeing how well you could decipher corn you know, or, or malt or rye, you know, from each other when, when they're separated. Uh, so, you know, having that hands-on aspect is, 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 is great. So yes, you could do it online, but I, I suggest the in-person version is much better. Uh, I've been able to, you know, be fortunate to do a lot of private trainings with bars where I go and just spend, you know, kind of the condensed version where I spent four hours training the entire staff uh, on bourbon. 
it looks good for them to be, you know, say, hey, our entire staff is, you know, is a Burmese cert- you know, uh, Burm certified. Right. So, um, so yes, you can, but uh, not, not suggested. So how do people find uh, Man and Oak? You go to manandoak.com uh, uh, and, and just check out the things that are coming up. Of course, everything is on hold right now because I usually use the on-premise uh, for a lot of, you know, my events. But, uh, you know, once we find our way out of this thing, uh, you know, we're, we're going to kick off. And I think to what, uh, you know, something exciting for Joe Lewis and, 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 you know, all of us within this industry is that everyone who is into whiskey uh, has been kind of so bottled up and, and you know, is just kind of jonesing to get out there. When this all ends, uh, you know, we're going to be excited about new brands to try. We're going to be excited about the brands that have messages. We're going to be excited about new restaurants. We're going to be excited just to get out there and just to try a lot of things. And the things that are going to have good messages and resonate are going to be really, really, really powerful. And uh, it's going to be cool to see. So, you know, uh, it, it's going to be exciting. Um, yeah. Michael, thank you for hanging out in the man cave. We we appreciate it. We I think we learned a bit today, Matthew. Uh, I, I more than more than I thought I would, and I cannot thank you enough. <laughs> no, thanks guys for having me on. Right on, mancavehappyhour dot com. It's uh, manandoak.com, dot com. Joe Lewis Bourbon dot com, and yes. uh, just uh, you got the store locator on there, right? Where's Joe? You can find out where it is. Numbers on that are growing daily. Thank you to Jeff and his team. So yes. Uh, JoeLewisBourbon.com. Find out where is Joe and uh, Peter and Michael. Thanks for uh, uh, bringing us on. Matthew and I are enjoying every every moment of our Tuesdays with you guys. Thanks every last start, yeah. Thanks, thanks for starting guys. my week out. Yeah. All right, here we are, gentlemen. Cheers. Cheers, Cheers. Thank you guys. Thank you guys. Cheers.